on our resilience and brilliance in America. Um, I wanted, I've started reading, I started already marking it up reasons, reasons I write, you know, I was like, Oh, you started with that. Um, <laughs> because, you know, I, I don't fancy myself a writer. Okay. So when I, but I, I'm a reader. Yes. Yes. So it's a different function altogether. That's right. That's right. Be, because I'm a reader, I can write, you right. know, because I do think there's a relationship, but I don't fancy myself a writer. I'm a creator. Yes, ma'am. There's something different. It is. You're a writer. Yes, ma'am. You you get up, you live, you sleep, you you work through words, I you do. put I things, do. you you song, you know, there's songs to you and hymns and like you manifest words and words become flesh. I love this. So you said I write because I believed I was ugly. Yes. Then I wrote myself into beauty and I, I had to put the book down and walk. <laughs> I had to walk on that one. <laughs> yes. 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 Cause that's, that's the assignment, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. That's the assignment. And what I learned through the word is that you can redo, you can undo, you can overdo, you can misdo anything. The, the point of the word is that the word will create or recreate for you if you'll take ownership of it. And part of the job, part of the job of colonization, Karen, part of the job of, of slavery was to do two things. Slavery really, the slavery colonization really sought to do two things. To number one, erase your memory of your own beauty. Slavery sought to erase African memory of its own beauty. Number one. Number two, to give spiritual authority unto the oppressor. Why is that important? So that when we start talking about or thinking about God, we think about them first. So whatever God said, mm -hmm. they had to approve. Right. And that's critically important. And so in this instance, right, um, we as African people here in America, practically all of us have struggled with uh, body image, uh, our, our notion of beauty. Am I attractive? Am I desirable? Et cetera. Mm. Why? Because really the auction block is really the framing of black self-worth. Which which in the coming, you masterfully lay that out to the point that by the time the our ancestors got to the auction block we were either de defiling our beauty to be right. less desirable that's or right. at the end wanting to be that's right <laughs> more desirable to the people who were buying us that's right that's right Ooh, that's that's that and only took heavy. a few months it only took listen, a few months listen heavy and and the piece that we never ever talk about Professor Hunter, the piece we never talk about is what was the psychosis of getting up on the auction block and realizing that someone bought you cheaply? What does that, that even didn't mean? Cost much. What, what, what does that mean? Okay. 866 We're going to go to the phones as well. What does that mean? How do you realize when, so you don't speak the language, you're, you're picking up things, you're, you're seeing multiple people bet on the, the women with their, you know, their naked bodies and form right. that, you know, right. are beautiful. So they're right. desirable to them. You realize those that look closest to the people who are purchasing are more desirable. So you've process that the ones that are darker with broader noses and thicker lips are not necessarily as desired. You're realizing this in real time. So how do you know uh, whether or not you were bought cheaply? I think there are all kinds no. of ways you know. Number one, many Africans could not speak English, right? But they knew how to count currency. Because remember, these are trades people. Most of these people come from villages and communities where they were trading with multiple peoples around the country. The second thing is, remember, most Africans initially don't speak English, but they are multilingual. Many of them speak many European languages and many African languages, right? The other thing is you start reading people's body language. And this is so profound about black people. You start reading people's body language in terms of how they are responding to your examination. 
right? And it's part of that excitement. When you see someone else being sold, when you see someone else who takes a long time to be sold, when you see other people coming a bit closer to look at this body, to reach out and touch it, et cetera, then when it's your turn, they sell you almost instantly. One, it's, it's, it's a psychosis, it's a deep thing. One knows then that I did not elicit nor solicit the praise or the admiration of these admirers. On one hell, on one level, it's like, so what? You know, because I don't want to be sold at all. Mm -mm. What's happening is black worth is being translated mm. into cash. How does that translate or how do we process that today? 400 years. I know you're going to ask me and listen, and here's how this happens. We have things now that are equal to the auction block. We don't call them auction blocks, but it's doing the same work. Karen Hunter, I don't know why you're trying to, you know. Come on through, really Dr. Black. Come on through. Come on. <laughs> we here. We listen, here. Listen, listen. Most listen. people home. Y'all home now. Miss Sophia home. Shut up. Pass the peas. Go ahead, Dr. Black. Keep talking. <laughs> and for example, it, it, it's called the NBA draft. The, NFL, the draft. Because what does draft mean? Even the word, what does it mean? It means we're trying to decide how much you're worth. We're trying to decide our imagined value that you might bring to this team. And why does the auction block um, symbolism work? Because there is an owner of all of us. We still call people owners of people right now. So those of us who watch the people who went to a combine, who went through a draft, got picked. That's right. That's right. What's our responsibility? Because and, and 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 mm -hmm. and those who didn't get picked. See, there's that's where it comes mm -hmm. in about this notion of being bought cheap. Mm -hmm. What about those who didn't get picked? What about those who had to watch the others get picked while they knew and believed they were just as you see? It's right. the it's the same psychosis. And then we have to figure out how to soothe the wounds of the unwanted, of the undesirable, but undesirable to whom? Right? To a machine that's waiting to use your body again. Ooh. So when did you think you were ugly and had to write yourself into beauty? As a child, I thought I was an unattractive child. And I thought who I was told, who, who told you that? I'm going to answer it this way. The, the question is, who didn't tell me I was beautiful? Right. They didn't say you're ugly. They just never announced my beauty. They never said, oh, my God, you're a beautiful kid. Or, oh, my God, what a joy that you are in my life, you know. A little boy, or they never said things like, um, uh, wow, you look like God, you know, or they never said, uh, my God, baby, you're a knockout. They never said those kinds of things. They, what, what folks said to me was uh, instructions. People, they told me what to do. Um, they told me what the price would be if I was not obedient. See, and this is what you tell people who do not have aesthetic currency. You prepare them for serviceability. The people who are pretty, right, we announce their beauty. They don't have to be as obedient because simply their presence is the gift to everyone else. The ugly people have to do homework excellently. Karen, I don't know what you're trying to do to me today, but you, but see, and that's how I knew. You see what I'm saying? That's how I knew. You know, it's so, the, so it's a nonverbal communication right. to children. That's and right. it's inherent in us because I can't imagine any parent, grandparent, auntie, uncle wanting to strip a child of a sense of worth and value, right? Uh -huh. I can, I can, not on purpose. Not on purpose. Right. It so to, it's, so it's, it's, it's inherent, right? It's, Absolutely. it's part of. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how do we address that in ourselves, what we do to others? 
Because the first thing that we're going to have to realize is the words we do not use when we talk to each other. But we use them in other contexts, right? For example, I've always wondered, well, I began to wonder as a kid, I always wondered why there were certain words we would use talking to God that we did not use in talking to one another, right? Like, for example, which I do now, so this is my answer to, the, right, which I do now and I do all the time, and Karen, it would, it would bring tears to your eyes to see people's reaction when I do this. And I do it almost every day, right? And, and I'm just showing the point, and of course people get it. Like, I'll, um, I'll see someone in, in grocery store, right? Uh, um, maybe a woman with, you know, some kids, she's about to check out, and I'll turn around and I'll say, uh, good morning, sister, I exalt you. And she say, you what? I say, I magnify you. Good morning. And she'll say, you what? It happens every single time. I said, I'm just saying I magnify you. That's all I'm saying, I magnify you. I bow before you, I lift your name up today, brother. See, it seems to me that that's the sign, right? That I'm looking at something and someone I adore and I admire. You see, mm -hmm. it's what we do not say, right? You know, what up? What up is, is for the grass. 